you know? Well, okay. HQET, you could say, is just an expansion in lambda QCD over MB or MC. So not quite. <laughs> Scat. Scat. Well, you've studied it. <laughs> but correct answer. <laughs> Any other thoughts? So another example would be something like non-relativistic QED. If you do non-relativistic QED, you're actually expanding in the velocity, not in strictly in the ratio of mass scale. So though they, you would think, for example, non-relativistic QED would be for a heavy electron, which is true, a heavy massive particle. That's not what the power ca counting expansion is in. It'll actually be in the velocity being much less than the speed of light. And that actually plays an important role in designing the effective field theory, determining what the leading operators are. So even something as simple as going to higher order corrections in hydrogen involves thinking about, thinking beyond this simple statement here. Well, since we're on the topic of hydrogen, let me go into a little more detail there. So just to flesh this out a bit and to talk about some of the things that you have to be careful about, I'll phrase an example of this statement as the fact that we don't need to know about bottom quarks to describe hydrogen. Well, that's good. When you took quantum mechanics as an undergraduate, you didn't have bottom quarks in your description. So if you did need them, you would have missed something. What did you have in your description? Well, in a quantum field theory language, you had this diagram. You had an electron and a proton with photon exchange. And you also, when you thought about the binding energy, if we work in units where h bar and c is 1, which I will always do, then the binding energy is a half me alpha squared. And if you ask about the bottom quarks, the reason that you didn't need them is because they were suppressed. They, were giving, they weren't negligible, completely negligible, at least at the level of how accurately we can measure this thing. Well, they're pretty small. They're at the 10 to the minus 8 level. Okay, and that's because they come in suppressed by the mass of the electron squared over the mass of the bottom quarks squared. So how would you think of them coming in? Well, you'd think of them coming in through some diagram, for example, where the bottom quark couples to the photon through a ver vacuum polarization like that. And this diagram, indeed, will give you corrections of this type. Now, it's a bit more subtle than that. And that's because a, a diagram like this also has other contributions besides just these ones that I mentioned here. So the basic picture is indeed correct that we can neglect the bottom quark because it's giving small corrections. But there is one subtlety, and that has to do with the fact that we have to decide what we mean by this coupling. OK? So from your previous courses in quantum field theory, when you learned about running couplings, you learned that diagrams like that one contribute to running couplings. And so the B quark, therefore, can affect the coupling. If you worked in, for example, the MS bar scheme, since it contributes to the running of the coupling. And in particular, you know for the electromagnetic coupling, if you ask about what that coupling is, it has a different value because it runs. It, if you evaluate it at a scale like the W mass, then it's like 1 over 128 versus if you evaluate it at a very low energy, the electron mass or below, then it's the classic 1 over 137.036. Okay, so there's some change, and the bottom quark is part of what contributes to that change. Of course, other particles are contributing too. So if we want to say this, this statement about bottom quarks and we want to state the conclusions more precisely, 
then we would do it this way. We would say if alpha is a parameter of the standard model, and we imagine that we fix it at high energy, so we could imagine that we fixed it by doing Z boson physics in an E plus E minus collider, but some process that's a high energy process, we determine, say, for example, this value. If we take that attitude as how we define the parameter, then the parameter that actually matters for hydrogen, which is this parameter at the low scale, does depend on the bottom quark. because how we get from the high scale to the low scale depends on the fact that the bottom quark exists. But we could also take a different attitude, and that is we could take a low energy attitude. So we could say, let's forget about doing high energy physics. Let's just do low energy physics and extract alpha of zero from some low energy atomic experiments. And if that's the way that we define the parameter, then the value can be used in other experiments, and then we never had to know anything about MB. So we didn't really have to know about the high energy, uh, about the higher, higher energy theory, unless we actually were doing some experiments up there. Any questions about that? Good. So if we want to write an equation for that, what it means is that when you integrate out particles like the B quark, remove them from your theory, stop considering them, that it's not simply the case that you generate higher order terms in the series. You can also affect what you mean by the leading order term in the sense of changing what you mean by the coupling. So if I write it in terms of Lagrangian, I would say that Lagrangian for hydrogen, if we include the B quark, well, it's got our proton, electron, and photon, and let's keep the B quark. Alpha and MB are parameters. If we drop the B quark because it's giving small effects, we just have these fields, proton, electron, and photon, we get a different coupling in, pr in practice, in principle. Okay, so you think of this as being a higher energy coupling and over there alpha prime being the low energy coupling. There's a lot of other things actually that if you think about hydrogen for a minute, there's a lot of other expansions that you've done. Hydrogen is a very uh, fertile ground for effective field theory. So let's do that. Let's make a little list of what we dropped when we thought about hydrogen. How much did we lie to you when we first taught you the hydrogen atom in, in, in a quantum mechanics course? Well, we didn't teach you about quarks. Why didn't we teach you about quarks? And the reason we didn't teach you about quarks is because if you think about the typical momentum transfer in hydrogen, three momentum transfer, it's of order the mass of the electron times the fine structure constant. And that's much less than the proton size. So the typical photons that are involved in binding together the hydrogen atom just have much lower energy. And they can't see inside the proton, they just see it as one overall object, and so we don't need to know about the quarks inside the, pro the proton. So that was an expansion.
it's also ins insensitive to the proton mass itself. So the proton we keep as an object, but the mass of the, again, the momentum transfer, Me alpha, is much less than the mass of the proton, which is of order of GV. And so we expand in our treatment of the proton as well. And basically what this means is that the proton acts like a static charge. Okay, the proton mass wasn't showing up in our lowest order description of the energy here. It would show up in higher order corrections that we neglect. And again, it's because we're expanding. And that actually affects, when we design an effective field theory for this situation, how we would treat the proton, what type of Lagrangian we would write down for it. And that will be one of our, our topics, is to figure out how we treat heavy particles, like a proton in this case. Another expansion that we did is we used the fact that the momentum transfer is much less than the electron mass, not just the proton mass. And that meant that the theory is non-relativistic, and that's why we did non-relativistic quantum mechanics. If we wanted to do it as a quantum field theory, we would do a non-relativistic quantum field theory. So already in something as simple as hydrogen, we have here three expansions plus many more, thinking about the particles that we neglected in the description. Um, so the second point, when you yeah. have ME alpha, yeah. How do you know that's not just a ratio of ME by MP rather than MP alpha? So, example, yeah. Electron was one GUV. That's right. Uh, so, would care about it. absolutely. So, in some sense, I could have written ME here, and that would have been fine. Um, if you take these together, then of course you could take a ratio and get ME over M proton. Uh, the reason I wrote ME alpha is I was really thinking about the probe, the momentum sort of the non-static properties, the dynamics. And the, the momentum of the photons, the largest energy is this. That's why I was thinking about it. But you're right that I should write ME over M proton as well. Any other comments, questions? So another point that I just want to briefly comment, which has to be the, true if everything I'm telling you is right, which is, has to be true because it's what we taught you, right? Is that this whole description is true even though there's ultraviolet divergences. When you start doing quantum field theory, even if you do quantum field theory in this case for the hydrogen atom, you run into ultraviolet divergences where things are blowing up. Actually, even this diagram has ultraviolet divergences. So before you regulate the theory, the bottom quark loop is infinity. Once you regulate the theory, it's well-defined, and you can make everything well-defined. But you may worry that this diagram is, seems to be contributing an infinite amount rather than a finite amount. And the whole story goes through, even in the context of having ultraviolet divergences. That better be true because, for example, if we had graviton loops, they would also lead to ultraviolet divergences. And so we're neglecting gravity. So it better be that these ideas of effective field theory are not changed by having ultraviolet divergences. And we'll encounter that in our discussion later on. OK, so that gives you a bit of a sense for how these ideas of effective field theory, you've been using them all along, whether or not you knew it. And we will, in this course, flesh out how we figure out some of these corrections, how we would actually compute them, how we would actually figure out how to even the leading order, what the leading order description of a theory is in cases where we may not know it, or someone else hasn't figured it out yet. Those are the type of things we're after.